Yes, okay, so we'll come back uh, and welcome to those who are joining us um, just this uh, afternoon. Uh, to start with, I would like to remind that this activity is part of the study day uh, Algerian and Anglophone Cultures and Literatures, uh, an event organized by the Department of English at the University of Gelma. And now we are about to start uh, our third uh, part, which is uh, the afternoon sessions. Uh, as I have said already uh, yesterday, it was more about sociolinguistics. Today, it's going to be more about literature and translation. Uh, this morning, we, uh, we listened with great pleasure to the talk of uh, Professor Hafid Kwaiti, uh, which was followed by a very enriching and very, very interesting uh, session about translation, Algerian history and translation. And now we are going to proceed to our next session. Uh, the one uh, that, uh, that has been entitled Algerian Literature, a Comparative Perspective, because I think, again, that it's important to link Algerian literature with this kind of uh, international uh, scope, to give it this kind of international scope. So we will have uh, two speakers for the time being. We have first uh, Dr. Bougassa Amina, and we are waiting for Dr. Nuwara to join us, hopefully, um, uh, in a moment. So then, uh, without delay, uh, Bougassa Amina. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a, a note. I did not receive a note from you. Yes. But all I know is that you are from the University of Constantine and that yes. uh, you are going to speak about national identity in African American writers and Algerian writers. Recently, Dr. Bougassa Amina, I'm from the University of Constantine. And now I'm working at the University of Tissensis, which is 700 kilometers away from Constantine. I worked on my PhD on African-American literature, which I'm trying to marry in this work with the... A presentation of my work. The, uh, the work is entitled National Identity in African American Writers and Algerian Writers. I chose Richard Nathaniel Wright, which is an African American writer, and Ahlam Mustaghani, which is an Algerian uh, writer. She is the first writer, Algerian writer, I have ever read uh, her books. So, and thank you, Dr. Fodal. This is thanks to you. So, um, okay. So, uh, let's start with a brief presentation with, uh, uh, of Richard Wright and at the same time, Ahlam Mustaghani. So, Richard Wright uh, is an African American writer who was born in 1908, Natchez, Mississippi. At the other hand, we have Ahlam Mustaghani, which was born uh, in 30th April, 1953. Richard Wright died in 1960 in France, and we have to keep that in mind because it's important. And Ahlam Mustaghani was born in uh, Tunisia of, uh, to Algerian parents, and this is also very important in the formation of their character and their political and uh, social um, um, what we say? Perspective. Both writers presented prominent uh, books. I read lots of books for Richard Wright, like A Native Son, Black Boy, and these two books made a controversial and a very, very inaugurated tradition of protests in the works of African Americans or Black writers. Ahlam Mustrami, I read for her so far, The Memory in the Flesh, and she presented other books like Chaos of the Senses and The Art of Forgetting Black Suits lately. Black Suits, you so well. So uh, Richard Wright is a best known as an uh, arguably the most notable author of the expatriate community during the 1940s and the 1950s and was extremely influ influential to a generation of black authors and American expatriates. If you take the first book presented by Richard Wright, Native Son, when you start reading it from the first pages, you're going to be astonished on how he presents the African-American society, which is completely different from what it was uh, presented during the Booker T. Washington 
I'm sorry, I'm going to add some more details, uh, just uh, hints of details, and I'm going to send to all the, the, prayer, the people present here more details if they want to uh, read about them. At the other hand, we have Ahlam Mustaghani, who is an Algerian writer, certainly, but she was born in Tunisia to uh, Mohammed Sharif, who was a revolutionary leader in Algeria. And of course, she was born in Tunisia because he was exiled uh, to Tunisia. Okay, Richard Wright was uh, raised by uh, illiterate parents. On the other hand, Ahlam Mustaghani was raised by a father who was really, really interested. He was teaching French. Of course, he was obliged to teach French, but he was teaching French at uh, schools and he later on uh, pushed his daughter to study uh, Arabic and then she's going to use it for her writings. And that will make her the first writer to write Arabic literature for Algerian, uh, as an Algerian writer. Richard Wright, on the other hand, was a writer that brought a prominent writing to change the view of the world of the white America to uh, what, they did, what they were doing to African-Americans. So this is a small comparison between these two writers. I'm, not, I'm trying to be a little bit brief, so I save a little bit more time to uh, open a door to conversation. So uh, Michel Fabry said that Richard Wright's uh, works were deeply controversial pieces which explored the complex aspects of the Negro problem. Sorry to use the word Negro, it's not mine, it's Michel Fabry's words, in America, often centering around bold portrayals of vicious racial violence, which is really, if when you are going to read these works, you're going to be faced with um, a terrible scenes. On the other hand, we have Ahlam Mustaghani's style, which is completely new to me. When I started reading her book, uh, Memory in the Flesh, the first chapter was a little bit strange to me because I was not uh, introduced to events directly. It was like turning around the topic in a form of letters. And then in chapter two, she gives more details about the characters, about the events, about the, uh, her style. And I was astonished that an Algerian writer was talking sexually in a very classic way or classy way, if we, if we may say which is the opposite of Richard Wright. He was a little bit rude. When, like Dr. Gufaiti said, he was a little bit rude when he explained sexual scenes. Hannah uh, Mustaghani was a little bit better. She was classy in her description. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, that's a, a little bit rough cough. I'm going to take the coronavirus test after we finish. So I'm sorry. Okay, allow me to continue. Richard Wright. There is another point coming between Ahlam uh, Mustaghani and Richard Wright, which is the, um, the presence of Paris in their lives. In, Ahlam, in uh, Richard Wright, he had a difficult life as a, a slave. Of course, his grandparents were slaves in America and after the abolition of slavery, they tried to look for economic and social security, which was really difficult for them. He uh, visited France in 1947 and he was astonished how free he could be in France, the opposite of what Algeria was living at that period of time with the French co uh, colonizer, okay? So uh, France was colonized in Algeria at the same time. It was given freedom to black writers who were visiting France, which is completely controversial or uh, impossible to believe. 
in Algeria, it tried to repress Algerians. No Arabic, no Islam, no uh, talking about religion. But when an African-American goes to uh, France at that period of time, at that same period of time, he was free. He was seen as a human being. He was um, behaving as an intellectual and he was free to write, to publish. Okay, this is another point. But the other point we're going to see is the definition of national identity. So to be brief, a uh, national identity uh, by, by definition is a sense of national belonging, is a feeling of being connected and accepted within one's family and community. And both writers, Richard Wright and Ahlam um, Mustaghani, have faced troubles with connecting with their families. Ahlam Mustaghani was like a rebel to her family, to the Arab society, to the Algerian society. No matter how independent we are, Algeria was free, but women were not. A woman is not supposed to write. Even if it, she is supposed to write, she has to respect certain boundaries. She is not supposed to talk about men, to encounter men, to have a sexual or a love affair with a man. On the other hand, we have Richard Wright who wrote about the trouble of identity. He had a big trouble and he represents African-Americans of the period to identify with two different societies. And that's why I asked Dr. Gafaiti to answer my question about identity. Was there a problem to, with Algerians you know, 30 years ago or 40 years ago to identify with those new societies they are visiting? Richard Wright, as a writer, had a problem to identify with his own society, community, a black community, and to, with the white community. As a woman, Ahla Mustaghani was supposed to be the obedient woman, to say yes. The same thing was faced in America to African Americans. A black man is supposed to, to be obedient towards the white society, you have to say, yes, sir. There is no sir and there is no arguing. When you, he is, he returns to his society, to the black society, he is supposed to be strong because the streets, uh, the streets were tough. He had to fight for his life. Ahlam Mustaghani at a certain point of her life, she had to earn her living. She started providing poetry, so she started to uh, write um, uh, novels and like uh, the doctor, the last doctor who spoke uh, from England, she said that Ahlam Mustaghani was forced because she was writing in Arabic. She was an Algerian who presented Algeria in a very different way. So both writers, though they lived in a separate period, they encountered the challenges that challenged their identity. They could not identify completely with their societies and the other society. So this is uh, one uh, definition. So uh, national identity is also important in helping uh, human development and combating behavior problems and depression. Another definition says that it is a self a sense of belonging with one's country and community that can positively influence one's sense of identity and how much they participate in society. It is also, it can also improve, improve physical and mental health, which is really important for writers. Some writers were called crazy because they were doing something that the society, the, our society, do not accept. A sense of belonging includes feeling secure, recognized, suitable, able to participate like a fish in the water. And that's why a lot of writers leave their mother countries to live abroad and to publish in a different language sometimes. Though Ahlam Mustaghami did not do that, she was strong enough to publish in Arabic, even when she lived in France and in Lebanon. So she published in Arabic and her books were later translated to French and English. Yes. Okay, so our novelists, Richard Wright and Mahram Mustami, followed their lines of thought and action in searching for national sense 
of national and national identity. And the questions really that, are, that we ask is how to discover a passionate purpose and role in life. And this, uh, what we're going to uh, face when we start reading their novels, uh, Black Boy and uh, Memory in the Flesh. We're going to see that their protagonists were struggling to uh, find a purpose of life, to not quit, uh, the, uh, the main protagonist in Ahlam Mustaghani's book, uh, Khaled, was uh, fighting at the beginning of his life. And then he lost one arm. And then he was trying each year and maybe each day to look for a purpose until he falls in love. And of course, he's going to face lots of troubles. The protagonist in Richard Wright's novel also struggles through his life to find a purpose to, uh, to show that he is worth being considered as a human being. Um, we have another point is the, the, uh, the role played by France in the culture of these two writers. So we have that a point that the United States of America and France had established at that period of time a strong intellectual relationship since the, colony, uh, since the colonization of North America. On the other hand, we have Algeria, that Alger France to Algerian writers represents the colonizer. So they refused its culture, though they wrote in French. We have France, on the other hand, in America has been seen as a symbol of democracy and cultural richness. That's what we said that Richard Rand, a lot of African American writers fled America to live in France because of the freedom they found there. In 1945, uh, the French occupation forces arrested the father of Ahlam Mustaghani because he participated in the uh, demonstrations of 1945. So she had really that bad memory about uh, the French colonizer. On the other hand, in uh, the United States of America, France has been a destination for Black Americans to travel and um, most, uh, most likely to settle down there because they wanted to uh, be freed once for all. Now, for what concerns the uh, national identity, when to express a sense of national belonging, Ahlam Mustaghani uses a memory in the flesh, women's as a metaphor, uh, as metaphors for the nation and women's bodies as sites of national struggle. Of course, she used lots of metaphors, but we're going to concentrate only on one. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's going to take forever. So she concentrates in memory in the flesh, embraces, of course, Algeria's past and present. It starts with the Algerian Revolution in the 1940s and in 1988 with its eye on the future. Through her work, Mustaghani continues what her father started in the 1940s, namely the process of decolonization. According to Mustaghani, the liberation of the land was the beginning of decolonization, not the end of it. By writing in Arabic, Mustaghani accomplished another victory of the system of colonization. Her use of Arabic language helped erase the barbarian marks of colonialism. The novel starts out as a love letter to a, to a woman. It slowly unravels the idealization of the Arab homeland and forces the narrator to reconstruct what it means to be Arab and Algerian as the love between Khaled, the protagonist, and Ahlam, the female, proves treacherous because he's good, he's, we're going to see that he is much older and he used to be the friend of her father which is really a little bit strange. So does the Algerian city of Constantine emerge? Of course, the context is mainly um, a, refer a reference. There is always a reference to Constantine since uh, she loved Constantine and her protagonist is supposed to be from Constantine.
no longer does it live in the beautiful signs as the mother's bangle or the bridges crossing the city alone. These are not my words. I'm going to give you the, uh, the, um, the biography at the end. But in corruption, poverty, and jail, as a symbol for the Arab homeland, Constantine does not allow for comp compromises or beauty, uh, beautific beautifications, but demands to be understood in its complexity. When you read the first chapter, you're going to see that though the protagonist was in love with Ahlam, he feels a certain guilt. He knows that the relationship is not okay, but though he couldn't, uh, he couldn't uh, impeach it. So it is in this sense that it cannot be captured whether in literature or art. In the end, it remains aloof and without compassion. The relationship to the city becomes an emblem of the character's reach for national identity, both at home and abroad. When you read uh, Ahlam Mustaghani's uh, book, you're going to see that whenever Khaled is, for example, he's going to be a uh, beginning, he is going to participate to the, um, uh, the revolution, uh, the wars. Uh, for two years, and then he's going to be injured and sent to Tunisia. And then after Tunisia, he's going to go back to Algeria and then to France. And when he settles down in France, he's going to always keep in mind that he, even he, if he lives in Tunisia or France, he always has something to relate him to Algeria. Like um, Professor Gafaiti has said, we are Algerians. And we always be Algerians. So no matter where, where, no matter how many languages we speak, no matter how artistic we are, we always identify with Algeria as our, uh, our, our mother, not just our motherland, but our mother. In the other hand, we have Richard Wright, which is going to be my last point. I know I took lots of time. Richard Wright, on the other hand, does not identify with America as his um, motherland. He... Uh, through his uh, novel, he, he seems fighting the idea that he is African-American. Sometimes he wanted to be seen as white. Sometimes he wanted to be seen as black. And at the end of his life, he uh, finishes his life uh, a, par a paranoid about the American system, about the American uh, way of treating African-Americans. He finishes his life questioning everything about America, the culture, the people, the, uh, the, the religion, everything. On the other hand, we have Mr. Rami that carries the respect of Algeria, of the culture, of the people in her, in her heart still our days. And that's it. So, so because there are so many, so many, so many details and I don't want to treat and it's really, 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 really uh, lovely. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamdi, for opening these doors to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bugessa, for, uh, for your presentation. You. And then uh, to the debate, maybe if you have any questions again, any feedback uh, to share with uh, Dr. Bugessa. Yes, please, Buthayna, go. Uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Hamdi. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bogasa, for this uh, very interesting uh, comparison. Uh, what I'd like uh, to ask you is um, on the comparison process. I myself am working in comparative literature, and I'm working with Algerian writer, uh, Cameroonian writer, and a Nigerian writer, all of which are female writers. Um, you said in, uh, in your comparison, you talked about uh, gender, being the protagonist, uh, being the, sorry, the authors, when we have female and when we have a, uh, a male author. And each of them uh, faced some challenges, right? Don't you think here it's a little bit, if I may say unfair, because remind you that she is a woman, she comes from Algeria, and the, the struggles she faces are um, probably uh, more or less complex than uh, the African-American um, author. So here we have the gender, first of yes. all, the gender uh, comparison, and then we have the culture, the background. Uh, how do we compare backgrounds? Uh, I feel that when I'm writing, I feel that every time I write about a background or a certain culture, I compare my own uh, culture with the Nigerian and the Cameroonian, because 
I cannot distance myself from these two cultures. I feel that I'm not being fair in uh, the representation of these two cultures among the authors as well as um, the, the protagonists of the, of the stories. And then we have the identity, the issue of identity that I find really, really complex we have, because we have uh, the national identity, which can be seen from um, uh, the collective side, and then we have the individual identity. So my question is, how do we compare uh, different uh, concepts and different um, points without, uh, with, to be fair with to all the authors that we are tackling? So I'm just asking about the process of the comparison. Thank you very much. Never mind. It's okay. It's a really nice and interesting question. And I really encourage the way you're doing your research, three different writers from three different cultures. Uh, listen to me. Uh, when I did my research on uh, African-American writers, I chose two different writers, Richard Wright and Amir Baraka. So they were two African-Americans from uh, the same culture, the same background, but the time differs. When I tried to do, to conduct this small research, I tried to be a little bit courageous. I tried to to take the side of a feminist point of view. I tried to be a little bit courageous. When I say Richard Wright on the one hand and uh, Mustaghani on the other hand, we have, certainly, we have two different epochs. Richard Wright lived at the period of uh, post-slavery, so the ab abolitionist uh, era. But Ahlam Mustaghani is post, lived in the period of post-colonialism, and she didn't encounter the colonizer directly, so she didn't see the bombing and everything. So uh, it is true, it is unfair, but I wanted to be a little bit bold. But when you conduct a research, you have to be reasonable. So you have to make, you choose the gender, uh, you have to be fair with the background. Basically, we choose two people who share the same background or even uh, sometimes the background is close to one another. I'm sorry, maybe it's just, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is, this is definitely uh, a kid-friendly event, no worries. Yes, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I forgot what I was saying. Yes, comparative literature, even to me, is a new field. I told you that Professor uh, Hamdi opened these doors to me when she announced the uh, this event. So I think that someone else has to answer this question and enlighten both of us. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I, 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 yeah, welcome. I see that Narjis yeah. yeah. uh, is uh, willing to, to say something, I think. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Narjis, please. Narjis? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. now, yes. Oh, okay. I just want to comment on this idea of being fair. Uh, okay. We don't have to, this idea of being fair. Yes, okay. Okay, that is, I, I mean, we need really to simplify things for ourselves. That is, uh, it's normal to, uh, to refer to ourselves when we talk or when we try to analyze others' cultures. And I'm sure that others are doing the same thing. That is, they are referring to themselves when they are trying to know th this other. Can you hear me, Huda? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, okay. So this is the idea, I mean, of course, we need the objective tools to do this, but at the same time, it's totally normal to refer to one's identity, to refer to one's uh, uh, culture while doing so. So no need to feel guilty about this, I think. So my point was, uh, yeah. uh, when Professor Bogasa said uh, that Ahlam Musanni's style was classy and uh, the African-American author um, yeah. style was a little bit rude, I mean, to what extent can we judge uh, that this is classy and this is true? Is yeah, it on it's the in the way level? in explaining the scenes. When you read the scenes, trust me, mm -hmm. I could not, I read them and I could not include them in my research because my father was going to attempt that uh, defense <laughs> of my presentation. I'm sorry, I had to do that. I omitted these sexual scenes respecting my father. But when I read them, they were really strong, but when you read those sexual scenes presented by Ahlam Mustaghami, they were like, 
referring to things, okay, in go on, Dr. Gafaiti. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. Amina also is willing to say something. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, Professor uh, Gafaiti go, and then Amina, you can. No, no, no. Uh, she she came. She came first. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, fine, Professor. If you want to go first. No, don't, don't make <laughs> the old guy out of me. <laughs> <laughs> the elders. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Amina. Then. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bugasa, for this very interesting paper. And I'm very interested in your ambitious project, actually, like to compare American and Algerian authors and um, analyze the Algerian identity, which is very, I think, difficult to deal with. I mean, um, I was just wondering, because uh, you've mentioned the racial, the colonial, and the patriarchal tropes. I was wondering if you wanted to deal with Malika Muqaddam, which I think is uh, would be a very interesting um, uh, comparison with Richard Wright, because she has this, she, I mean, in one of her novels, Les Hommes qui Marchent, she would find a lot of examples regarding the racial, the colonial, and the patriarchal tropes, and the ways in which she had to, to go to exile and write an overseas prose that would reclaim, in which she would reclaim her past. And as Professor um, Gafati said, if we are Algerians, and we will still and remain uh, Algerians. But yes. if you if you read if you read uh, the the prose of Malika Muqaddam, we'd find that there is a rejection of, of identity of the cultural identity identity because there there is a difference between the cultural affiliation and the national uh, affiliation. So you might read this uh, distinction or you might read this rejection of this fragmented belonging of Malika Muqaddam, but therefore a reinforcement of belonging. Therefore, she would still reclaim her past through her narratives, which I think would resonate effectively with Richard Wright's um, uh, literature. Thank you very much. I, uh, like I said to Dr. Uh, Hamdi, uh, when I was looking for new uh, things to do after my PhD, I found first, I'm sorry, I checked the uh, CV of uh, Dr. Hamdi and I was very jealous. <laughs> That's why I was haunting her and I was looking for what was she, uh, what was she doing. And I found this, uh, uh, they she programmed and I did my best to participate. Trust me. I took the list, the teachers or uh, the doctors presented before. Trust me, this summer is going to be about Algeria, Algeria, Algeria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's why I need to keep in touch with all of you, if you allow it. Of course. I'm gourmand for literature. Um, you really are opening a lot of a wide ocean for me to to dig in. So thank you very much, really. Yeah. Of course, there we go. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Faiti wanted to add something, maybe. Um, you know, uh, regarding this issue of uh, identity, I, I'm glad that uh, Amina made the distinction between national. Uh, identity or or belonging and and uh, individual identities. We have to be careful not to make uh, out of the, this term a, a fixed uh, entity. You know, in this regard, I think it's really important to go back to uh, I don't remember who referred yesterday without naming him uh, to the concept by Omi Baba of the third space. But there's uh, also a very important author I'd like to refer to, Stuart Hall, mm -hmm. who speaks of uh, identities hyphen histories, identities histories. That is to say that our identity uh, is fluctuating in uh, relationship with uh, our personal histories, national histories, and so forth. So the notion of uh, belonging to a, a country or referring or being rooted in a country does not exclude the, 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 the idea of diversity, the idea of multiplicity. And I think that it's very important. What is, what is it to be Algerian? There are very different ways to be Algerian. And that's something we need to, to, uh, to uh, cherish and to, to defend because Otherwise, we would fall into some kind of monolithic uh, vision or uh, discourse that would be exclusive of the diversity of the country. Uh, 
and we referred to this discussion yesterday. When, you, for example, I was asked uh, uh, why I do not write in in Arabic, modern standard Arabic. But you know, the very first uh, written language in, uh, in in Algeria was not Arabic; it was Tifinagh. Tifinagh, which is the language of the Tuaregs, which which is more than two thousand years old. So. That's also something that's part of us, obviously. And I think it's important to keep this kind of situation, uh, how do you say, a uh, reality in mind. Uh, as far as comparison is concerned of uh, authors, take La Soif by, uh, by Asya Jabbar, that was written, I think, in 1959 or so. There are some incredible sexual scenes described in that novel. And uh, she was, uh, how do you say, challenged uh, for that. I mean, she was very courageous, you know, for uh, a woman to write in those terms. The same issues actually uh, face non-Algerian authors. When you think of Françoise Sagan, Bonjour Tristesse, Christiane Rochefort, uh, Le Repos du Guerrier, in, in the mid-50s, it was like a revolution, you know, and the same applies to Anglophone. Uh, writers. In your presentation, I'm, I was really interested in, in the comparison. I think uh, going back to uh, Butena's remark, I think it, it is legitimate to uh, compare different authors, but to be at the same time aware of the levels of comparison. Mm -hmm. We can uh, compare different authors for different uh, reasons. And uh, I think it's also important to, one thing that I think we maybe uh, necessary to develop in your in your uh, study uh, uh, is the uh, the literary dimension because you mentioned the historical background you mentioned the cultural uh, comparisons and so forth but I think it's also important not to uh, to uh, put aside the text and in this regard you can have some very close relationships beyond the, the language used. Let me take two specific examples, the authors we have referred to. If you take Tahar Watar, for example, Tahar Watar's models, literary models, are mostly the French and Russian realist uh, novelists. Uh, Zola, Balzac, and on the other side, Maxim Gorky, and uh, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Pasternak that has also to do with his political perspective. But if at that same time, you take uh, other uh, writers such as Mohammed Dib and uh, Kateb Yassin, uh, they were much more uh, related to the American writers. I mentioned in particular, uh, William Faulkner, John Dos Passos, that I didn't mention yesterday or this morning, and in particular, uh, John, John Steinbeck. And in the case of the generation that comes after Mohammed Dib and William Faulkner, there is a transition through uh, the French new novel, but uh, based on the American novel. Because at the time that you describe when Richard Wright is, is, is coming to Paris in 47, at that time, you have really the explosion of the American novel in Europe. That's the time when French writers are exposed to American literature. And that's the time when, for example, uh, the, 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 the movement of the, the, the new novel, uh, Le Nouveau Roman, uh, is going to be very, very strongly relating to, to American authors along with James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. So in the case of uh, Claude Simon, uh, who is uh, one of the leaders, and Alain Robbrier, you have that transition that comes through Faulkner. And then from Faulkner, you have the new generation of authors who are going to uh, be influenced uh, by the mediation of, uh, of, of Claude Simon. Take the case of Rashid Boujadra. Rashid Boujadra has as a literary model Claude Simon. I give you two examples. In uh, uh, in, in uh, la, la, uh, la Bataille de Gibraltar, La Bataille de Gibraltar begins like this: jaune, puis jaunâtre, puis jaune à nouveau. That comes directly from La Bataille de l'Impasse 
in Claude Simon, noir, puis noirâtre, puis noir à nouveau, where Boujdra is not plagiarizing uh, his model, he is writing in dialogue with him. See what I mean? He's establishing a filiation. So that in terms of, uh, in, 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 in the, end, the end result is that you would have a more traditional type of literature exemplified by Tahar Watar, Abdul Hamid Ben Hadduga, that was mentioned uh, also earlier on. Uh, also some, you know, French, uh, how do you say, francophone writers. But on the other hand, you have a different type of filiation by authors such as Katib Yassin, Pujadra, and others. It is in this regard, it seems to me, that uh, we have always to keep in mind the literary dimension when we get into comparative study. Thank you, I'm sorry for uh, this. Yeah, if I may add just something to, the, to this comparative uh, dimension, I think that uh, it can be also interesting to compare, if you take it from a kind of intersectional, you know, uh, dimension because you, you, when you spoke about uh, Mustrani, you spoke about the fact that she, she comes from post-colonial country and she is a woman and everything. I think that it can be interesting to compare to compare her with uh, or any uh, Algerian female writer who uh, who evokes such issues to African uh, American women writers because they too uh, have this situation of post-slavery situation right. segregation and everything. But at the same time, they are women in the American society, which is also taken to be a very patriarchal society in its way. So you will have this kind of intersectional, um, and you can even add class if you want. Uh, so you will have the same, uh, the same tropes, uh, the, same, uh, the same referential, I would like to say, that may give you ways uh, that may lead you to other writing strategies to, to go beyond what, uh, as Professor Gafaiti said, to go beyond uh, the, the purely descriptive, you know, of the thing and to go to more uh, literary uh, strategies and so on. I think that it can be interesting. And I think that you, uh, you need the starting point, I guess, you need to define it well if you want to, uh, to have a good uh, comparative result. Uh, Professor Mami also would like to, to ask a question. I don't know if he is, uh, yes. Yes, please, well, just unmute, please, your, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just briefly, uh, a propos de Miss, uh, or Dr. Bougasa, uh, idea of, uh, of uh, she said, as she was reading, she was struck by the fact that Halem uh, Zdrenmi refers uh, somehow explicitly um, to sexual scenes and so on. Uh, let me remind you, we need to make a clear distinction probably uh, between, well, and this is not me actually, this is, this is a rich literature uh, that discusses this. Let's make, this, let, let's make a distinction between uh, the pornographic and the erotic, okay? Well, of course, the pornographic is very uh, base and very bad and so on. Whereas the erotic is uh, complete, something uh, completely else. It's, it lies at the opposite end of, uh, of the first. So you need to, and uh, sometimes you have uh, certain cultural traditions and you have certain uh, paradigms of power that usually uh, want to, uh, how shall I put it, want to uh, debase the erotic and cast it like the pornographic in order to quell uh, a potential for change, a potential for revolutionary change or not necessarily politically, uh, even culturally, to quell this, uh, they will tell you, oh, be careful, this is bad and so on. Uh, that's why you need to read these texts uh, very carefully. Uh, okay, yes, I think uh, it's fine when you have, because there you're not, uh, well, it's not debasing or no, no. Uh, actually, it's very revolutionary and very, uh, we need to read them critically. I mean, this morning, uh, Gafate uh, referred to this idea that we need critics. And uh, here, I think our role as uh, consumers, or shall I say, appreciate people who appreciate literature is to uh, make this distinction that it's uh, okay. We, you have plenty of, uh, uh, of texts that usually refer to, uh, explicitly refer to uh, what you call, you find somehow uh, offensive, uh, be careful, you need to make a distinction, okay? Because they are not that uh, 
not not over time. Sometimes they they call for uh, a subversive outlook vis-a-vis -vis the world. Okay. Yes, and um, what I would oh. like to add is actually this. Uh, what we tend also maybe to to forget somehow is to to consider that if you look at our popular culture, you know the songs that our grandmothers use it to sing even in weddings and. Uh, you know, they are really erotic, that, actually. That really, we, we they're tend pretty to see, bad, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> actually, we tend to consider that uh, uh, that talking about sexuality and everything is something yeah. daring and something uh, yeah. new. And but actually, if we go back to the traditional culture and to uh, the oral patrimony and matrimony. Uh, we have songs which are way, way, way more uh, erotic and more uh, yeah. uh, full of sexuality and full of description of uh, of bodies and yeah. Uh, so okay. yes, I, I think that we uh, we need to put this also in this kind of general background as if there was a kind of um, rupture between this kind of oral tradition and uh, this passage to the written form. Well. Uh, uh, and we have the impression that then we forgot that initially we use it to talk about these uh, issues in in a, uh, in a much more uh, freer way actually than we uh, presently do. Um, yes, okay. So I don't know if uh, someone else would like to add something. Otherwise, yes, I, I, if I to... may, if yes. I add one, one thing, I think this is the the issue that you uh, described are very true. I'm very grateful to Professor. Uh, Fouad Mami for stressing what he did. It's very important. And uh, uh, many other authors who are non algerian were confronted with this. You know, Les Fleurs du Mal, you know, Baudelaire was uh, uh, prohibited from, from, uh, from being uh, circulated. In the case of, uh, there, was a, there was even a trial you know, for, about Les Fleurs du Mal. Uh, the, the American writer, famous American writer, Henry Miller, who's described as the pornographic writer. I mean, he, he had to publish his work in Paris, you know, uh, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, and then the trilogy of Sexus, Plexus, Nexus. And uh, all of his works were, were prohibited in the United States until 1962. And he had to go through a trial, his publisher, and this was the central argument of uh, uh, Professor Mami. The, the central argument is that he had to demonstrate, and that's what he did in court, that his work was an artistic work, that it was not to be compared with the pornographic work. And I think this is some, uh, an issue. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, Amin Zawi, who was a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, I mean, Zawi is confronted with this kind of issue, and he's not the only one. You know, many other authors, you know, Bujra and, and authors are confronted with these issues. And I, I totally think that it is the role of literature to put forward all the expressions of the, the, human, uh, the human identity and body and, and, and how do you say, gender issues uh, or oriental, uh, how do you say, sexual orientation and so on and so forth. That's, for example, one of the issues that confronts uh, Nina Burawi, you know. Mm. Uh, so I think it, it, it's very important that we, we put this forward. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you all again for your uh, contributions.